Hey guys, Nick McDonald here. I have Phil, who's the trader for the Signal Kilimanjaro, uh, and I'm pleased to present to you guys an interview where I'm going to talk to him about his experience trading the markets, uh, what he sees in the markets, how he makes trading decisions, and importantly, what gives him an edge that makes him believe that he's going to be able to succeed long term. So, thanks for your time today, Phil. Yeah, cheers, Nick. Thanks for uh, inviting me and hi all. Yeah, no worries. Nice um, Hawaiian shirt you got going on there. Well, you know, I, I had to put on a good shirt, you know, since I'm on um, since I'm on camera. It's normally my holy t-shirts. Yeah. Exactly. And what are the perks of being a day trader, right? Well, that's right. That's right. I even put some trousers on for you guys too. Did you? Okay. Thanks, man. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So. Um, if you want to maybe talk through basically your experience, how long you've been trading the markets, uh, what you do, and how you, I suppose, yeah, just just talk us through your journey up until this point. Yeah, yeah, sure thing, Nick. Um, so I studied as a civil engineer um, at university, and then did a bit of travelling overseas, as a lot of Kiwis and Aussies do, obviously, do the OE, and uh, and then came back and um, did a little bit of engineering work. Um, and then a, 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 grad, a grad job um, came up, advertised at Westpac. And I hadn't done any banking before. I didn't really know what banking was, but I guess just as a civil engineer or an engineer, you know, you've sort of got um, a reasonable affinity with numbers and you sort of like processes as well, I guess, and you like sort of nothing out problems. So that's um, so that sort of made me a reasonable fit, I guess, to, to apply for that sort of job. And... Um, Got in there, got one of the grad jobs, and so started at Westpac in Wellington, and so um, that was all very cool and all, all quite quite new. And um, I was lucky enough to—they normally do a roundabout, so you do a bit of time on sales. You know, you might talk to the retail branches or a few more, a few sort of uh, small corporate clients, uh, and then you do a bit of roundabout and sort of, sort of sit in different desks. And I was lucky enough to um, get a spot within the first month on the um, the FX trading desk, and. Um, that just seemed to be a really good fit. I think, um, you know, I progressed reasonably well there. I was a little bit older than the standard 22-year-old graduate. I think I was like 28 at the time. Um, and so that probably helped in terms of, you know, maturity and I'd done my traveling and so I was pretty keen to get, you know, stuck into a new career. Um, and I sort of found trading was really an interesting mix for me with respect to, you know, these um, a lot of sort of um, quantitative sort of analysis, if you like, or these, you know, there's a lot of research you can read. There's a lot of, um, if you put these inputs into something, then theoretically speaking, this could lead to this result. So I guess that sort of suited the way I thought. But then what I really liked, and I think which um, I found probably more fascinating, is the sort of non tangible. Um, the non-tangible aspects of it, so more sort of human psychology, human behaviour, why do people do things? And yeah, yeah. and for mine, I think that's really the whole mix in trading markets, in any markets really. You know, you've got a massive amount of research and quantitative analysis, if you like, and a lot of inputs, but then at the end of the day, the market is just people like you and me, Nick, you know, and, and all your followers and so on, and, um, and what drives our behaviour. And, and as we all know that in markets, you know, A plus B plus C should equal D, but often it doesn't. So that's kind of the interesting part in, in, in I found. And so I think, you know, maybe with my background in engineering and I don't know, kind of the things that I'm into, um, that sort of um, helped me sort of get really interested in trading. So um, so I really loved it, you know, and you sort of lived and breathed it there in the early days and it was, it was fantastic. And, um, so I managed to get trading the Kiwi, the Kiwi, which was our main our main book at Westpac in New Zealand, based obviously because we're based in New Zealand, and um, did that for about five years, and then I was really keen to get overseas and to test myself in the the bigger markets, I guess. So we just to take a step back there. So with the the Westpac, so how did, exactly did that work? They just gave you an allocation, or did you have to work underneath someone else? Yeah, so it's something which I which. Um, well, it's good that we brought it up now because it's something which when I talk about why I've come into leaving the bank and doing my own thing and where I think, for example, um, businesses like yourself in the whole retail market, and I think there's massive potential um, 
it just sort of uh, fits in with that when we talk about that. But um, but so banking, bank or trading, if you like, was probably um, let's just say eighty percent of it, if not more, was more about executing customer and client um, flows. So you have a corporate, you know, yeah. you have a corporate, and they want to buy a whole lot of New Zealand dollars because they're an exporter, like Fonterra, for example, you know, our biggest exporter. Um, yeah. They might have to buy 50, 100 million Kiwi a day. So the salesperson will get that order off them and they'll go, hey, Phil, can you go do this? So you'll then go into the market. So when you're, so when you're doing that, are you doing that with a view to make a profit for the bank or are you doing that just with a view to, to, to lose as little as possible? Yeah, so ideally, ideally you, you always try to make money. You always try to make money. Um, you're 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 executing the flow for the on behalf of the customer, but around that you can then trade a little bit of it. So, for example, a lot of customers will just go, "I want a price." So you give them a price, and then all of a sudden they've transferred the risk from them to you. And so, as a trader, it's your job to manage that risk the best way you can. You, so you have a position. And you may make money off it, or you may not make money off it, or you might get out flat. So that was really a lot of the, you know, a lot of the traders in the banks back in the 80s and 90s, they were all sort of what they called the Barrow Boys from London and all that. They were effectively just market geezers who knew how to turn a dollar, you know. And so they would be in the market, pushing it up, pushing it down, spoofing the market to a certain degree, um, because the market was effectively 30 people like them, you know, all working for different banks and they were the market. So a big part of the job was to actually um, manage the risk that the bank got, and the bank received the risk via customers, whether it be a corporate or a hedge fund. So that was a big part of your job as to how did you execute into the market, and you used to have voice brokers. It used to be pretty exciting stuff, really. You know, it was a lot of sort of bush bosh and pushing the market around and a lot of yelling and screaming, and that's how it used to be. It was sort of um, probably, if you like, for lack of a better word, more refined when I joined the markets because we had um, automated, we had more electronic trading as well as voice brokers. Yep. Um, and so things become a bit more efficient and probably less, um, you had less input as a person, I guess, because it was more an electronic screen that you looked at as opposed to a lot of noise coming down a phone. But, um, and so that was part of the role. And then there's another part where we had capital where we could go and trade. And so they wanted us to go put positions on and to make money. So you're saying that the banks gave you capital to trade. So they basically gave you an allocation with the view of generating profit for the bank. Yeah, yeah. And so you could make money off customer flow, but then, then obviously you could also make money or lose money based on um, using the bank's capital. Yeah, right. Okay, so then... Five years at Westpac, you went overseas and said you wanted to try a hand. Was it in, in London, you said, or was it in oh, Sydney? So to Sydney, and so for the bank, so uh, the main book there was the Aussie book, obviously being an Australian bank and based in Australia. Um, and so the Aussie book was a big book. I think, you know, it's sort of like the fourth or fifth biggest traded currency or something like that. Um, and so we saw a lot of different flows, and I had more capital to trade. And so that was sort of... Um, really getting getting involved in a, in, a, in a more in a bigger way really um, I also got my first sort of management role there um, managing a desk of traders um, and yeah so that was exciting times as well and so that was a natural progression for me um, I did have opportunities to go over to Singapore or London as well but um, the Sydney market actually was surprisingly big it was was um, bigger than what I thought it would be um, mainly yeah. probably because it was the Aussie dollar as well and so that sort of served its purpose in terms of wanting to be involved in bigger things. Um, and then we got to a stage after five years there that we really had to either commit one way or the other. So either buy a house and live in Australia or come back home and um, continue doing things here. And as my kids were getting older, we felt um, from a more life balance perspective that um, coming back here was, was the right thing, which was good. So... Yeah. Yeah, so then, so I was at ANZ here in Wellington for the best part of four years. And in the last year or two of that, the market once again in the industry more so was actually changing. And um, I actually didn't think it was initially sustainable being a trader in that form or shape for a bank. Um, 
The emergence obviously of the internet and online trading ability was a big thing. Along with that, um, information is effectively free, free-ish now. You know, um, for example, 10 years ago, to get a bank's research, you pretty much had to be one of their big top tier clients. Um, and, and so they really sort of protected their, their, um, information, their information and research and used that as leverage to get big clients. Now, pretty much, I can get pretty much all the bank's in, um, information because it's all there. It's all there on the internet somewhere, actually. Um, so with the fact that the industry was changing in that the advantage of being in the bank wasn't necessarily the same. Um, you can be at home and you can have access to the market in pricing. Um, you can put your own capital in and you can get the information and research. Then it sort of led me to be thinking that, you know, the, the advantages of being in the bank aren't there as much as they used to be. So where it used to be maybe 80, 20 advantage of being in the bank, I think it's probably pretty close to 50, 50 now. And then when you add in the fact that you've got the versatility and flexibility of working when you want during the, the whole course of the 24 hour period, um, it sort of seemed to be a bit of a no brainer for me. Um, and the model, the model for, I think, traders in, in the banks, I think is a little bit struggling a bit actually, because, you know, when you think about it, you know, you sit there for 10 hours of the day now, and then you're too stuffed to look at the market after that, when really the market's a 24 hour period and you're sitting there for 10 hours and there may not be opportunities, you're not really doing 10 hours of uh, good productive work. Whereas in a situation like I am now, you know, if I choose to do 10 or 15 or four hours or whatever that happens to be at that particular time, I know that when I'm at the desk, I'm actually producing something um, or ideally working on something. And um, so, so that seemed to make a lot more sense to be a sustainable model. And the, uh, the other part about the industry changing is that where I talked about as a trader, you might for 80% of your time be executing customer flow. There's a lot more sort of automated systems now that customers are actually just pushing buttons and not talking to salespeople and the flow will just turn up into the bank and then they'll have a automated system to actually clear that flow. So that role of the, of the trader has actually changed to now probably more 80% of the time you're actually trying to make money trading the bank's capital in a proprietary way as opposed to trading customer flows. All right, so just going back to well, just if I could ask a question about when you did work for the bank, like what kind of capital were you managing and how did you perform? Like, did you, were you successful um, and how successful? Um, so I guess if I say, um, 15 years at the bank, close to 15 years at the bank, um, the last sort of 12 years, I always received a bonus, which was, a good thing you know we got paid we got paid um, bonuses based on performance so and that would be based on your own individual target um, and also another factor would be your desk target and how you achieve you know whether or not your desk got close to achieving that target and then um, your geographical area or your product group and then the whole bank so there's lots of different factors but what I liked about trading was that your number's your number in terms of what, you tra what you're making in, as a trader. You may not always get rewarded that way, or some, in some years you may have got rewarded more than what you should have. But what I could always, what I liked about trading was that I could go back each day or each month and then at the end of the year and go, well, this is what I achieved, profit-wise, um, and then at least benchmark myself on that. And so I, I like to think, you know, based on the virtue of that, I did manage to, well, you know, I was in that industry for a reasonable long time and left on my own accord because you can get quite a lot of um, movement in that sort of role. You know, people would lose their jobs. Um, um, and the fact that, you know, I was always pretty well regarded and wanted by banks, you know, I used to get poached a few times, um, managed to manage a desk and always receive bonuses that, um, that I always sort of, you know, did a pretty good job. You always want to make more, you always want to earn more and that's, and that's not a bad thing. Um, but, I, but overall, I found, and that's what enabled me to have the confidence, I guess, to come out on my own. I, I pretty much just looked at it and went, if I can have access to the same research, which I can, I've got capital, and it's not as much capital as the, as the bank had, but it's my capital, and 
So if I make money, it's all my money. If I lose money, it's all my losses. But, you know, obviously you don't need the same uh, size as capital for the bank as he did at the bank. Um, then I like to think that I can emulate the same things that I did where I can make money. So I've been fortunate enough that so far um, in my first year that it's the model seems to be working. Um, and it's, you know, I've, I've turned a positive number and I've um, been able to make a sustainable living out of it. So that's been pleasing. And so... Um, sorry, have I lost the track of your question? Yeah. So, no, no, it's all right. So, what kind? How much money were you pushing around? Like, what did they give you? Like a, a float in like a bankroll to to trade, or did it not work like that? Well, we sort of pretty much got not a fixed capital number, but we had a budget. So, let's just say typically my budget was say three million dollars. It varied between two and seven. So um, let's just say three or four million dollars as a budget for a year to make for me to make as a trader. So you'd have to generate between two and seven million dollars for the bank a year. Yeah, as an individual. Yeah, yeah, and it might depend on what sort of role you had or seniority. Some of that was they expected you to make out of the franchise or the customer flow that I talked about before. Um, but you know, really, in the last sort of five years, the customer flow franchise value diminished a lot. And so I'd consider a lot of it, you know, 80% of it was sort of proprietary trading, a little bit like what I'm doing now. Yeah, right. So just to take a step back then, so your budget was anywhere from two to seven million. Yeah. Um, and you you got a bonus the last 12 years. So I'm guessing you came pretty close to hitting budget. Yeah, well, sometimes it would be 60% of budget, other times it was 100% of budget. But okay, um, so know, then let's say, I just want to, so let's say you hit 3 million over the space of 12 years, so you made the bank, made yeah. well yeah, so you, uh, you made around, somewhere between 30 and 40 million dollars for the bank, right? Uh, yeah, probably more like, maybe close to 30, I mean, gee, if I, if I really want to, if I really want to look at it, closely uh i'll go three 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 there and then a five and a five and oh look somewhere between 25 and 30 million i'd say i'd say over, over my time yeah right okay it's pretty impressive oh well it's but it's just a scale factor though nick you know at the end of the day isn't it yeah. do you know what i mean i don't get all that by the way <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know mate. i know that's why you don't that's why you get a very small, small cut of that nick <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but um look you know it's um you know if i can make let's just say if i make 300 so if i make 10 percent of that instead of making 3 million if i make 300 thousand that's all my money that's that's a lot of money as well right so but it's not a lot of money when you throw it around compared to that but the fact that it's all my money or all my loss so um that's sort of what I've sort of been doing is like looking at the scale and go, well, if that's a sort of typical position size I took. At the end of the day, I used to just look at it going, that was, so if my budget was 3 million, I want to try and make 300 grand a month. And, you know, also I don't want to lose. And our loss limits were around about 300 grand a month as well. So we had to report that if we, or stop trading for that month. And so that's sort of the model I've tried to bring into this one here, which is I've got a certain amount of capital, um, I'm prepared to lose, you know, I've got a budget of how much I want to make a month. But if I lose that much in a month, I might have to take stock, not trade for a week, have a little, have another think about what I'm doing, um, see where that loss came from, or I may continue trading and, and use the following month's allocation. So there's a little bit of discretion, obviously, because it's nothing, there's no hard and fast rules. But that's the way I used to think about my trading, you know, that we had an annual budget to achieve. How do you do that by breaking it down on a monthly basis, um, roughly? And that's sort of the what I've tried to try to bring here while working for myself. If it did, because that's the way I've always done it, and it seemed to work for me for the last 10, 15 years. So, um, so I've just tried to transfer that model across. If I can expand on that idea um, that you've been successful up until this point, like what makes you think that you've got an edge on the market, like in the constantly evolving world of algorithms and computerized trading and you know it's just a living breathing thing the forex market why why do you think you're going to be able to make money consistently moving forward yeah so um 
for me, I think it's, you know, the, the, you know how I talked about what I believe is the, what is, makes up the market. You know, it's a lot of quantifiable things and a lot of intangible things, you know. So it's a, it's a touchy-feely aspect and there's a really sort of hard nuts and bolts data-driven sort of thing as well. And, and so I think understanding and acknowledging that for me is a, is a really important thing um, because I, that's, the way I, that's what I believe it is. Um, and so I just think that, you know, you've got to have a versatility and flexibility in, in the way you think and do things. And I like to think that I do that. Um, I stress test my, my trades to a certain degree before and after. And if something worked out well, I try and look at the reasons why it worked out well and how I was thinking about that and then how I can use that to emulate on my next trade. And, and conversely, when things don't work out well, I look at the reasons why that may have occurred, what I was thinking, how I was feeling at the time. Did I read the, you know, did I read the, analyze the data as best as I could? Um, and also, you just got to also acknowledge that, you know, there's a bit of luck involved as well. And sometimes you get it wrong and sometimes you get it right, you know, because you can overthink these things as well. So I, I like to think that I'm just um, flexible and aware of all those things. Um, um, and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to change and alter things. And that might just be in terms of what's triggering the market. So, you know, as we know, the last week or so, well, probably the last few weeks, it's been a more of a risk on, risk off thing. And, and for those that may not have heard that particular type of terminology, it's, you know, flight to safety. So money's going into safety, safe, ha safe haven assets. So they're buying bonds, they're buying Swiss, they're buying gold, they're buying yen, those sorts of things, um, when it's risk on. And when it's risk off, um, oh, sorry, when it, yeah, sorry, that's when it's risk off. They're, doing this, they're going to sa their safe haven and they're selling sort of commodity or higher yield sort of currencies like Aussie and Kiwi. Um, now that theme, used to be a quite a big theme maybe for a, a three-year period what I recall uh, five years ago but the last couple of years hasn't been that and it's been more on Fed expectations um, broad US dollar uh, interest rates and so my point being is that you know the market because it's like what you say it's an organic thing and, and it's based on a, it's a whole lot of humans are the participants they will then um, they can change what they look at and so it's important to be versatile about what's triggering the market. And so I like to think that I'm across that reasonably well and that I'm happy to change my styles. Um, and then a little bit more about the whole industry, you know, with the whole emergence of uh, more electronic trading, this big, massive retail market that you're involved in and that we're all involved in now. You know, you've got to be versatile in that. And I think an indication of that or an example of that was the fact that that's why I wanted to get out of working for the bank because I saw the actual industry changing to the point where it didn't really make sense for me to stay where I was. The opportunities are out here. So I like to think that that versatility of thinking with a, you know, a, a backdrop of um, confidence, because you've got to believe in yourself. But also I like to think that I've got a reasonable amount of humility. You know, I, I like to think that I can take a loss and, 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 and um, own up to a loss, which I think is really important for a trader as well. Um, um, I have. I sort of like to think that I, 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 I look at those things as well pretty well. Okay, great. And what are some of the biggest challenges that you've faced along the way? Um, well, it's, you know, it's, there's always that sort of pressure or um, of, and especially in, in trading for a bank, you know, you know, if you don't make the numbers, you can effectively lose your job. So, you know, you've got, um, you've got to be um, comfortable that that's the game and that's the, that's the possible repercussions and, you, and you'll get highs and lows in that journey, you know, and um, I sort of, uh, and that can be very challenging, but at the same time, I actually quite like that, that sort of, um, that sort of spins my wheels, that sort of thing. So um, it's always a challenge to sort of um, overcome some of some of the, the highs and lows and, 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 and not get carried away with the exuberance, but also not get too down and dismal when things aren't going so well. Um, a obviously, it's been a challenge leaving the bank and trying to set up my operation here. And that'll and that, a lot of that's just about belief, but also just about getting infrastructure right. Um, 
and and making sure that I've got you know all the instruments there and the tools and the capital and the access to the markets. So um, that was a challenge before I did that because I didn't know how that was going to roll out, but that seemed to roll out pretty well. Um, yeah, and really just the ongoing pressures. I mean, there's some interesting. You know, I've got obviously different um, pressures in in your online community in that I'm actually um, managing well for lack of a bit of managing um, people's funds or at least people are following your signals and so you know your your performance um, has a big bearing on their performance and so that's a different dynamic that I didn't really have at the bank so that's been a challenge but I think I've sort of grown a lot over the year for that and I think you know we've had plenty of discussions about how that's been yeah okay right um, yeah I know that you initially certainly had a little bit of trouble finding your feet but it seems that uh, in the last sort of two to three months especially you seem to be tr trading with a lot more confidence so um, yeah I've, I've definitely noticed a difference. Yeah I mean I've still um, you know I've still got plenty of work to do on the signal side um, with respect to just finding that sweet spot of the right amount of risk and you know that's why a couple of weeks ago we talked about it and how I've dialed up the risk a little bit more um, and it'd just be a gradual thing. Um, I mean, ideally, I want to target sort of more around 5% a month in my signals account. Um, and as part of that, it's going to be dialing up the risk a little bit. Um, and that's okay. Um, in my other account, you know, I'm sort of probably hitting more towards 10 plus percent a month. And that probably is traded a little bit more like the way I used to trade at the bank. So. Um, and that's just me, it's not investors, it's just me, so um, slightly different accounts there because of the, I don't know, because of the um, vested interest in it. And so that's yeah, so just on that, so you said like for, for those of you out there that don't know, Phil's got two different accounts, he's got a Signal account that he trades for us on MT4 um, and a Currentx account uh, which has more of a direct feed from what I understand and you've got most of your money in the current X account So can you maybe talk about just how much of your own money you got on the line? Um, and what your expectations are with that with that bankroll moving forward Okay, so we've well, effectively got two accounts of pretty similar so a couple hundred grand in each of them or oh, sorry in each combined so a hundred I've got a, I said a hundred grand in my signals account with you um, and a um, hundred grand I have in the other account. Um, the other one's grown about 140% over the 11 months. And that's been my main sort of, um, because it, when I first left the bank, that was what my intention was, was I'm gonna go and trade money, my own capital and make money and live off that myself. Um, then as you know, you know, you know, I hooked up with you um, a few months into it and you know, I was amazed about this massive retail market and, and, and how all the signals worked and now these managed accounts. So that's really exciting to, to sort of be part of, and it is exciting to be part of. Um, but that wasn't my initial sort of thing, and I wasn't really aware of that. So um, my my trading account is doing pretty well, and that's where I'm making my money on. Um, this one here, I see great opportunities, and I've learned a lot about the signals account. And obviously, you know, um, the returns are pretty pretty minimal at the moment, and so that's why. I'm sort of slowly trying to dial up the risk to emulate a little bit more like my other account, um, but I, 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 but I don't I don't think I'll trade it. I don't think I can trade it exactly the same way. I mean, I think you know with the signals accounts, you've got people's money there, and they have you've got to manage their expectations and their comfort levels, and there's a whole lot of different individuals in that. Um, and also managing the fact that you know people can chop and change from trader to trader based on their comfort. And so um, I think the idea is to try to have a more of a steadyish sort of um, um, return profile for the signals. And so I'm just trying to, I'm continually trying to refine that to get the best thing for that. And, you know, um, for me, it's, 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 you know, the big part of it is the drawdowns. I mean, I think, you know, the drawdowns have to be really relative to what you make on a monthly basis. And so, I'm sort of just wary of trying to keep a nice sort of steady line on that. Yeah, right. Okay, so your, your current X accounts, you've got a couple of hundred grand, you've made 140% in the 11 months. Is that, did I understand that right? Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about the 
the SMB situation earlier in the year. Obviously, um, a lot of people lost a lot of money in January as a result of the Swiss National Bank unpegging their currency to the euro. Uh, you were long at the time. Um, and I know that you lost a fair chunk of money as a result of those positions slipping through the stop losses. Um, so what have you learned from that and what have you sort of put in place to make sure that you don't get caught like that in the future? Yeah, well, firstly, I mean, you know, regardless of how it occurred, it was, you know, I'm responsible for that loss and it happened. And so, you know, um, I think that's the first thing to sort of be wary of in that. But yes, there were some mitigating factors in it. But at the end of the day, I was solely responsible for it. So what I learned from that was that I is that different platforms and different um, yeah different platforms um, have different levels of effectiveness. So in my Carinex account, I lost hardly anything. I put my stops above the floor, um, and the reason why I put my stops above the floor was because I wanted to what I thought have the best chance of getting out of that position before other people did, if it looked a little bit, it was looking ropey. So I had quite a large position in my current X and I got filled at 02 and 03, which is where I put my stop above the floor. I had the same levels for my Axie Trader account, but got filled a lot lower. And my understanding is that's because Axie the pool of liquidity that I was able to access was only internal clients, so only other Axie contributors, whereas my current X actually hit the whole market. So that was a learning experience, uh, an expensive one. Um, so one lesson from that is, you know, um, don't necessarily rely on all the capabilities that you think you might have at your disposal. Um, and the, probably the biggest thing though was that, you know, I was playing in a PED currency and um, you know, there's obviously if a, if a peg is removed as it, as it was, you know, it, you can get a lot, a lot of slippage. So I use stops, as you know, and so even in these volatile markets, I may get some slippage, but I won't get to anything to the degree that I did with that, with um, the euro sort of stuff. So I guess the big learning thing was I won't be playing around in the, in the peg currencies and, and I'm also just very wary of some of the limitations of some of the platforms. Okay, cool. All right, so what can the subscribers and investors and that look forward to moving forward? I mean, earlier you touched on the, the slow, stable returns. You think that's that's the way to go? Um, if you maybe just expand on that a little. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think for in signals where you, where, your client base does have the ability to maybe move around a bit more and 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 that's absolutely fine that's all their choice um that if you've got volatility in your p l profile you know if they're there for two months when things are going well and then they pull out oh sorry and then you have a couple of bad months and they pull out and go somewhere else that over a 12 month return um they may not get the full benefit of of what you've achieved in that 12 months and so um, I think the future for signals is just trying to have a more steady steadier profile and as a result you know you, 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 um, yeah right that's just more of a steadier pro, uh, PNL profile so what I'm trying to try and do is just try and target more close to that five percent and keep it more consistent um, yeah. um, but I think my my real sort of interest would be more in the managed fund space yeah Okay, so what's a, like what's the worst case scenario for, for clients that, let's say investors in a managed account or on the signal, I mean the managed account is obviously the, the future, like what what would be the worst case scenario that you think that they could expect? Well I think people, you know, if they even just look at the time of the flight at the moment, um, that the biggest drawdowns are ideally not greater, this way I believe, you know, the way I believe it, the biggest drawdown shouldn't be greater than what you're monthly trying to achieve, say, in that particular month. So if, for example, you're hitting 10% returns, then um, your biggest hit shouldn't be shouldn't be more than, say, 10%. It might spend a little bit more, but I don't think it should be a 30% hit. 
because you don't really want to wipe out your whole your whole um, growth um, yeah. with a bad month. So um, if I'm trying to target five percent returns, then I may have down days of two or three percent, absolutely. Um, but you know, I'd probably be looking at a monthly loss of somewhere in the five to eight percent as a as a maximum drawdown for that month. Because it also, if you're trying to achieve five percent, you are going to have times where you are exceeding down five percent. Yeah, no, I understand that. Okay, all right. So five to eight percent, worst losing month. All right. So what I'd like to do now is maybe if you could share your screen um, and maybe talk through uh, sort of how you make decisions, what you're seeing in the market. Um, like I know you trade a lot of the Aussie, a lot of the Kiwi, because that's your specialty. Uh, like earlier in the week, you're into a um, an interesting Aussie Kiwi position where you were shorting uh, into volatility um, and I think you ended up slightly behind but after doing a huge number of trades some of them winners, some of them losers. Uh, right, so just with respect to sort of what I look at um, and how I make some of my trading decisions. Um, so I basically have three screens set up. This is the screen share of one of them. Um, uh, and this is a Bloomberg program that I subscribe to, or Bloomberg service. And so there at the top of this, so I just have a scrolling news effectively there, so that sort of keeps me abreast of some, you know, through the Bloomberg news service of what, what's coming out. Um, beneath that, I've just got a little sort of currency spread matrix, uh, which is just basically just telling me where, where currencies are on different, different pairs. Um, Below that, I, and then I, below that I have some chats, so I've talked to a couple of different banks and a couple of other uh, traders as well, and that's just sharing ideas. Um, uh, and then to the right, of the, that's basically the calendar, so that's, a, that's an ongoing calendar of data releases, and then I've just got some other news services. So that's just it helps me keep abreast of what's going on in the market, effectively. Um, so this particular one here, well, I guess I should explain that. So, so that, so the things that I look at for trading. Um, uh, so, I like to think I'm a combination of sort of fundamental macro things, um, some technical thrown in there as well, and um, and then looking at sort of relative value and correlations. So, what I mean by that is, um, I look at so in terms of uh, relative values. I look at where interest rates are. I look at where, say, commodities. Whatever I think are the triggers, you know, oil's been a big part as well. Um, and then I'll relate that to the currency that I'm looking at, and I'll try and get a bit of a relative value of where I think things are too cheap or too expensive on that. Um, and then I'll look for some sort of mean reversion for that. So, for example, let's just say, for example, what well, we can use this for the last couple of days. So, Kiwi rallied well, the best part of 150 points over the last 36 hours. Um, it exceeded other uh, currencies, it outperformed other currencies. Um, and um, compared to say what commodities had done and what maybe what stocks had done, even though those things had rallied, it, 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 at the end of the day it exceeded it. So then I look at that and go, well, what's the reasons behind that? What do I think are the validity behind those reasons and is there an opportunity? And sometimes things will move just because it's a bit of a conditional squeeze or there might be the M&A flow and it might sort of put things out of kilter a bit and then that's where I might go, well, that's an opportunity for it to maybe be revert. So just on the particular screen, at the top left here, I've just got the indices. So just looking at stock indices, you can see that things are in the red there. So what we've got Nikkei down 4% already, uh, other Asians down there as well. Um, Shanghai's already opened down one and a half percent. Beneath that, I've got the Aussie um, bull track and Kiwi bull track, and I look at those. I've low prices for those. I find those really important because, especially for the Aussie and Kiwi, you know, if rates are moving, then the currency is more likely to move as well. Um, so you can see that all those Aussie bills and the Kiwi bills are all, all up in price. So they're up in price, down in yield, and as a result, Kiwi and Aussie have also come off. Uh, and then I've got some um, 
US interest rates, so euro dollar futures. Um, and then at the bottom there, that's, that's what I call my mishmash basically box down there. And that's what I, I put in there whatever I think is relevant at the time. So um, just with the, the yuan um, devaluation, you know, so I put in CNH there because I want to see what that's doing at times. Um, I've got the commodities in there because that's obviously been very topical for the last few months. Um, I had the Fonterra share price in there because it, at some stage the market was looking at that and that may have had a bearing on Kiwi. Um, I always have the US 10 year thing in the chart there as well because that's what it, um, can push around the US dollar. Um, so in those charts there, so for example, what are we looking at there in that top chart, that's the Kiwi currency and that's just on three day. I can very quickly just click on another, uh, so it's Euro, and so that's on the um, that's on the matrix that I showed you before. Let's quickly click on things. This is the Kiwi, and that just gives me a quick insight as to what price action is doing, whether it be in the last two days or the last ten minutes. Um, there's the CAD, and so I just like to have those sort of things at my fingertips effectively, so I can see what the price action is doing. And then as part of the price section, why that's important to me is that, say for example, if good news came out in the euro, for example, but euro only rallied a small amount or didn't really get on with the job, then I sort of look at that and go, well, maybe that's because of market positioning. And so I can see by the price section that maybe we'll, we'll tap him out. So then I look at it and go, well, so maybe on neutral news or no news or bad news, that's where you get quite a large risk of a decent correction. So I try and use um, price action along with um, particular data releases, if you like, to try and gauge current market positioning and sentiment. And it's a really intangible thing, right, because no one knows what a million participants have in their positions, or what they're really thinking. But I try and use that sort of price action. Okay, that makes sense. So you, how many screens have you got like that? Okay, so that's my second screen there, and then I'll just show my third screen. And that's my third screen, so that's my two platforms. Obviously, it's my Axie Trader platform at the bottom, yeah. and that's my current X1 at the, above. So, yeah, so I've got three vertical screens. So the only price action you look at is the, the screen that we just done earlier with the, the three different charts? No, no. Um, so this is a Bloomberg um, charting thing that I use. And this will actually give you a little explanation of some of the, you know how I talk about relative relative values and I try and incorporate not just what the currency is doing but other things that may yep. lead to some insight into a move. Yep. So this is a Bloomberg and so I'm going to pull up a uh, not the Kiwi chart. Just ask the question of do I just what sort of price action I look at it. So this is a one year Aussie Kiwi chart. Okay. And it could be a three day one, six month one or whatever. So sort of see, you know, other than this big mess of this was the space crash thing that occurred yeah. when I was growing up that um, Aussie Kiwi's kind of making a bit of an interesting sort of reach there. Some resistance there, you could arguably say that you've also got some rising bases here. So, you know, 109 figure is pretty important. 109 figure 30 is pretty important. You've got the mouse there. And then you've got lots of different tops, you know. I mean, I guess if Aussie Kiwi can get through 111.40 here, the next target is sort of this congestion in this 114, but the biggie is the 114. Um, so, I sort of look at longer term things as well. Um, these lines are um, moving day averages. So the yellow one here is the 200 moving day, and they are, and they can be really really relevant. People like to look at those as well. Um, but look, you know, I'm, I'm not a big technical chartist person, but I just tell you what something I look at. But in terms of um, um, correlations with other with other things, and, and I, look, I like to look at rates a lot. So what I can do is I can plot the, the um, against this Aussie Kiwi chart, I 
basically plot the, the the spread between the Aussie two-year swap and the Kiwi two-year swap. So effectively, what two-year implied interest rates are, I guess, for Aussie, and compare them to Kiwi. Um, and so you can see this is a six-month chart that back down here in March, April, the correlation was pretty good. So the yellow line is the difference between the Aussie interest rate to year swap to the Kiwi to year. So as that gets bigger, so as, the, as this yellow line goes up, that is the market saying that interest rates, are, if you like, are going higher in Australia compared to, relative to Kiwi, if you like. Yeah. To, or Kiwi is dropping faster than the Aussie. And so we know that occurred when in April, May, the RBA was starting to indicate that they had done enough cutting, they were on hold, and that the RBNZ had gone from four tightenings last year to, holy shit, we're going to start cutting. So the interest rate differential moved up, and sure enough, all the Kiwi did move up as well. And you had a pretty good correlation up to about the end of June, and then you, you can see from the last three months, the correlation is still strong, but if you like, it's at a premium, the rates are at a premium to the currency. I have a lack of a bit of description. Um, but you can sort of see that as things flip up, like there we've got the mouse, uh, the currency also moved up. So just because it's gone, I mean, normally these things are repriced in, but every now and then you'll get it where, say for example, this interest rate differential is showing a lot higher, but for whatever reason, and it could be through positioning, Aussie Kiwi is actually showing lower. And that's a case of divergence where I might look at that and go, if I can get my levels right, um, there might be an opportunity for it to catch up. So that's kind of um, an example of when I look at relative values um, and pricing and compare that to price action to see if there's any opportunities. Yeah, cool. Sense, mate, or like, uh, no, it does. Yeah, no, it makes sense. No, no, mate. This, this is the craft. This is this is what we do, right? So it's um, it's definitely interesting to to see what you're looking at on a day to day basis and how you're making your decisions. Yeah, and I find that I mean, in the Bloomberg thing, like um, just be just chewing the fat with you. Like um, you know, it's, it's, it's probably my biggest expense. My like Bloomberg's quite expensive, but it's what I. Nice It's about three grand a month. Yeah. That's about thirty. I'm paying about thirty. This is two US, two US. It's twenty-four US a year. But with Kiwi here now, it's about you know thirty-five grand. Yeah, thirty-five thousand dollars a year. Yeah, yeah. You need to make that bad, don't you? So um. Yeah. But you know, I know there's other cheaper free um, tools out there. But I but this is what I've always used. And I think it's probably the best one out there. I mean, it's the most sophisticated one, uh, and it's still the choice of banks. So I guess that's saying something, you know. And um, so I just put that in as part of my price that I've got to recoup from the trading. So but for now, I'm happy to do that, you know. Um, yeah, cool. Right. So and it's back back the camera. Camera. relative value stuff, like you can put up, you know, I could compare the Aussie chart compared to copper, you know, or compared to the two you can switch straights in. And that sort of helps you through, helps me with some correlation. Yeah, okay, great. I appreciate that. So you want to put it back on your camera? Because um, I'm keen to hear a little bit about the, the charity that we're doing a little sponsorship with, with Mount Cook. So for the benefit of the viewers out there, what we're doing is everyone that is subscribed to the Kilimanjaro Signal, we're uh, rebating $1 of every lot traded back to Phil's wife's charity, who um, obviously you're involved with as well, um, being being the husband, uh, and also everyone that signs up can will receive a 20% discount on the subscription fee. So that one dollar is partly being paid by us and partly being paid by Mount Cook. So it's sort of a 50 cents each um, contribution, and then obviously Phil is taking a bit of a hit in that um, we're taking a lower subscription fee. So, yeah, Phil, if you give us a little bit of background on, on what it is, and um, that would be great. Yeah, well, firstly, thanks, Nick, and, and Mount Cook guys to, um, to sort of uh, come up with this initiative. It's, um, it's really great of you guys to do that. 
Um, so when we went to Australia, um, Cass was pregnant with, I think, our third child. Uh, she'd been working as a um, medical legal lawyer back here in New Zealand. And when she went over there, she wasn't going to be working in that profession because she was having a child and um, also the challenges of doing that in, in another country and she was working part-time here and so she was um, happy to um, get involved in something else and so um, about after a few years over there so maybe six years ago now um, six seven years ago um, she well Cass and I traveled to Africa we'd, we'd done a bit of traveling there prior to having children and we always had a bit of affinity there um, and so um, she, we went over there on a holiday and um, basically, basically we met a group of displaced, internally displaced people, which came from the 2007 Kenyan of um, election violence. Effectively, it was a tribal and political party sort of, um, disagreement, if you like, and it turned into some pretty nasty stuff, you know, a little bit sort of synonymous with the, um, I don't know if you've seen the movie Hotel Rwanda. Yeah. It's a pretty horrific when considering you know Kenya had always been regarded as like a great democratic sort of African leading country. You know? um, and so there's some really nice stuff that occurred there and effectively you know, a whole lot of internally displaced people um, as a result of that. So when you met a group of about 7,000 of these guys, um, they were all in UNICEF tents uh, living on this patch of ground. They had been kicked out of their homes, moved to somewhere safe and neutral. And um, uh, we met these people, you know, and I went back to we went back to Sydney, and I went okay, back to work. And Cass went okay, I'm gonna you know, start a charity and help these people. And so she asked them what they wanted, and she thought they'd say blankets and food and things like that and houses. And they actually said, oh, we want we want a school book for us. The problem in, in probably most third world countries, and especially in, in Africa, is that um, you know um, they don't have enough. Governments, for whatever reason, don't have enough money. They have enough money to put into the infrastructure and into the class sizes. And so, you know, you can get up to 100 kids in a class, and that obviously is going to um, impede to education you receive. So, um, they wanted a school built for them, and of course, for the poor in the community. And so, that's what Cass started doing. And um, you know, the first year it was three classrooms, you know, and it was 90 kids. And I just thought of the stays. You know, something like that. Uh, now there's about 850 kids there, and they've got a teacher training college in Tanzania, and so and they've got a lot of collaborators going on with um, other organisations over there and, um, and the government. And so, so um, CAS, the charity, doing some great things, and um, they raise, oh, well, I'd have to raise close to like three million bucks a year. Because, um, but you know, there's a lot of people who are benefiting from that over there, and so. It's all based around education and sustainable programs. So it's not just about food and shelter, it's about empowering them. You know, it's a whole hand up, one hand out sort of mentality. Um, and so, yeah, so the school is there um, to basically help these kids um, get educated and get their own jobs. Um, and what was really important to the people as well is that they said that, you know, this, this horrible violence occurred um, not just because of its because there's poverty and, and political powers at play, but it's also because you know people are uneducated and, and, un, and unaware of what goes on outside of them. You know, and so they really wanted people to learn about what happened then, so it doesn't happen in the future. So um, yeah, so it's been going on close to six years now, and it's going to be great. It's a fundraiser over in Sydney, Nick, which uh, hopefully Walk me and you are going to hook up at and um, and um, go celebrate the charity. Yeah, for sure. So it's so so it's so you can is so you can dot com. Uh, so they can. So they can. Sorry. So they can. They can. Great. Yeah, we need this web page. Okay, awesome. Well, I'll put a link on the website too, so if people want to check out a little bit more, um, it's easy to do. Thanks, Nick. No worries. Okay. Well. That's um, that sort of covers everything. It's been a very in-depth interview. Um, really appreciate the time and appreciate you giving us a little insight into to what it's like to trade millions of dollars um, and sort of now live the dream of working 
in your Hawaiian short, Hawaiian shirt and shorts. So, um, yeah, hopefully there's a long road ahead. I'm very confident, uh, based on what I've seen so far, and you know, working with you fairly closely now for for getting on, what's it probably ten months now. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm very bullish on the future, and and hopefully we can get more and more people involved in following me trading. Thanks, Nick, and thanks, guys. Thank you very much. No worries. Thanks.